thank you, everybody. I hope you guys are ready to hear a little bit about biomanufacturing. So uh, a recent uh, interview uh, in the Financial Times uh, quoted Eric Smith, uh, ex-CEO from Google, and apparently a very clever guy, saying that the bioeconomy is the next big thing, uh, and also defining that bioeconomy uh, as uh, based on the stuff that is grown uh, using synthetic biology. I certainly agree uh, with uh, Eric, uh, but if we want to understand the future, I think it's always good also to, to look at the past. So uh, in its, its wide definition of using microbes to produce uh, valuable ingredients, biomanufacturing is actually probably older than civilization itself. Over 13,000 13, years ago, uh, humans uh, discovered that they could use microbes, natural microbes, to uh, process foods uh, into longer life products that they could uh, store and trade. Uh, and so these humans started making cheese, bread, beer, very important, of course. Um, but during all these thousands of years, uh, biomanufacturing and uh, microbial fermentation remained pretty much a poorly uh, understood art. Uh, for us uh, today, uh, the concept of modern biomanufacturing means something slightly different um, that we can equate to precision fermentation, meaning uh, using very specific microbes in very controlled environments to produce very large quantities, uh, again, of defined products. Um, but the transition from this art fermentation to precision fermentation didn't really happen through a single breakthrough. Uh, as Sir Isaac Newton uh, once uh, wrote, uh, if we had seen farther, is by standing in the shoulders of giants. And when we talk about biomanufacturing, those giants are microbiology, molecular biology, uh, and synthetic biology. Understanding the principles uh, of uh, microbial fermentation is something that really started to happen in the 19th century, led by microbiologists like Louis Pasteur. Uh, Already in the 20th century, in the 1980s, uh, what we now consider rudimentary molecular biology uh, allowed uh, Eli Lilly, for example, uh, to launch their first recombinant uh, human insulin to the market. You will hear a bit more about this uh, from Garrett later. The synthetic biology revolution of the 2000s and the 2010s saw a number of companies popping up uh, using precision fermentation, uh, in this case, normally using conventional hosts for it. But has been the recent advances, uh, the sharp decrease uh, in the cost for writing uh, and reading uh, DNA, together with the appearance uh, of uh, more advanced uh, genome editing tools like CRISPR that have allowed the engineering of less conventional hosts with uh, more desirable uh, native traits, like, uh, for example, uh, being able to feed on the CO2 from a flue gas, or being able to thrive in the harsh conditions of mines and, and oil wells. So as Moji mentioned this morning, uh, now is time for biology to shine. Um, let me uh, go back to Eric Smith uh, to tell you a bit more about the present uh, and the near future. So. Uh, I have mentioned that uh, uh, microbes, uh, engineering of microbes has come a long way. Uh, and uh, the thing, the reality is that biomanufacturing is already, um, is already uh, disrupting some, uh, some markets. Uh, food, for example, uh, even in Texas, uh, is uh, common uh, in any supermarket to, to find an impossible burger, but also cosmetics, vaccines, antibodies, uh, nutraceuticals, flavors, fragrance, even uh, microbially derived silk or, or leather. But what all these uh, ingredients have in common is that they are actually quite expensive and therefore their volumes are not super big. Um, then economics and sustainability of these processes is possibly less relevant. Uh, but Again, it's not working. Uh, for Semvita, <laughs> in our mission, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we need to have a substantial 
nature positive impact. And to have that impact, we do focus on ingredients that have the potential uh, of being made and sold at very, very big volumes, such as biofuels and commodity chemicals, uh, expanding uh, to, to specialty chemicals in an opportunistic way. So let me tell you a bit about how do we engineer those microbes to make what we want. The concept is actually borrowed uh, from uh, software engineering and is through iterations of cycles of design, build, uh, test, uh, and learn uh, cycles uh, in our biofoundry. Uh, as I did mention before, several companies still restrict themselves to uh, the use of conventional microbes, but at Senvita, the cycle uh, normally starts with a selection of the host, uh, the host that is best suited for the task at hand because it can use a given feedstock or because it can produce the molecule that we want it to produce or a precursor to this molecule. Uh, then the uh, next step is, of course, uh, engineering this microbe to improve production and growth, and we do that through uh, gene editing by adding, deleting, or modifying the genes of the host uh, in, in the relevant metabolic pathways, of course. Uh, the outcome of this step is normally a, a, a library of variants that is then tested for their performance. Nowadays, uh, this can be done uh, quite fast and efficiently, uh, thanks to leveraging robotics, automation, and other high throughput uh, techniques in our biofoundry. This generates a lot of information that then uh, is processed with the help of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and then fed back to our metabolic models, so we go into the next cycle. After a few rounds of these cycles, uh, once the strains are good enough, bioprocess uh, is developed and then scale up for, for production. So I did mention that we and others can engineer microbes very well, right? And even that there are some companies already disrupting some markets, but uh, can biomanufacturing already tackle on commodity chemicals? Can we make commodity chemicals at a cost? Okay. Uh, the answer is probably not, but we are getting there, and there are actually two problems that we collectively and at Senvita need to tackle in the near future. And these are, in my opinion, the cost of the feedstocks and what I see as uh, problems in lacking optimization and, and possibly also financing. So going to the, to the first point, uh, current biomanufacturing processes uh, currently use uh, sugars and other agriculture-derived uh, uh, products uh, these, uh, as feedstocks. And these uh, compete uh, with food production are prone to price instability due to supply chain issues and have large environmental footprint. So these factors uh, do uh, hamper the, um, the scalability of these uh, bioprocesses, not only from the economical perspective, but also from the overall sustainability. However, there are two factors that make it possible for biomanufacturing uh, to compete with the petrochemical industry uh, in the near future. Uh, and is that oil, that uh, cheap and abundant uh, feedstock of the petrochemical industry is uh, uh, becoming more and more expensive and less abundant. Uh, and second, that the biomanufacturing industry uh, is having access to more available and cheaper uh, feedstocks. Uh, and on this regard, the concept of using CO2 as feedstock is actually very attractive because it's not only cheap, but also linked to tax credits in most countries, what can potentially lead to very disruptive economics. The second factor, oops, in my opinion, uh, is, is the result of a catch-22 situation. So here we have uh, synthetic biology companies being able to engineer micros very efficiently, but not being very good at scaling up industrial processes, at optimizing them, and also not having the financial muscle to build dedicated plants that can profit from uh, uh, then economy of scale, uh, uh, more optimized supply chains, etc. And therefore, biodrive products remain expensive and, and therefore low, uh, small in volume. Uh, this valley of death uh, is just too deep, too long for, for these companies. So as discussed just in the energy transition panel right now, uh, it will be uh, up to larger companies to bring in that industrial exp experience uh, and also uh, undertake those capital expenditures. 
Uh, it seems that I'm a bit uh, over time, so let me just uh, leave you with, uh, with a thought, and is that only by combining state-of-the-art uh, strain engineering with the highest degree of process optimization uh, and the adequate level uh, of investment by your processes will, uh, uh, will get to, to being economical and being able to compete. Uh, and we at Senvita, we are ready for that, and we, take what, we have what it takes to do it. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe.